Hey guys, welcome back to a seller sessions back in the hot seat is Steve Simonson after a long and stressful week. He's been looking forward to this lovely hour that we spend together to uh, discuss behavioral habits in and around uh, COVID-19. Is that right? That is right. Yes, I uh, I do look forward to a, a respite, uh, even if it's just a short period of time between uh, running uh, around trying to save the world. It's clearly not going to save itself. That's what I've concluded. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Um, so just uh, as we before we get going, what of um, what some of the things that you've been up to this week, if you don't mind sharing with the audience? No, no. I think uh, one of the things I can share is that uh, I'm setting up some new businesses and yeah. some of our current businesses are not doing great. Uh, they are in segments that uh, are, are not great. And so we, you know, those are pivot moves, right? Yeah. Uh, there are some of those businesses either with partnerships or adjacent to partnerships that they're not doing so hot. So we have to really try to figure out how to put people back to work. Mm. We do not have the luxury um, of just having people on the payroll forever when you have no income coming in. Uh, yeah. As an example, if you're your main client base, so this is this particular thing is not Amazon centric, hmm. but if your main client base has been closed by the government, it's like you can't open your competitors are open, by the way, but you can't hmm. open. That makes my sales ability low. If, yeah. uh, if people are doing the math at home, that's a low sales ability. Mm -hmm. And so we can't just keep people on the payroll indefinitely because there's no money coming in. Hmm. And I know that everybody says, uh, hey, you know, uh, you know, be good guys or be nice guys or, you know, Steve, you must have some money buried in your backyard. Just give it to the other people. Uh, <laughs> that is my banking system, by the way. It's uh, backyard locations. So you, in your backyard, do you not have the money tree where you could just go and pick dollar bills off of? We have picked and planted the trees so bare that there is hmm. nothing on that tree, I assure you. So the, the point is whether you are. Yeah. A little fella like Steve or Disney, yeah. eventually, if you have no revenue, the, the people have to, you know, kind of be put on hold. And that's why all the government programs are there for unemployment and backstop and mm -hmm. so forth. We want to employ people. We love our people. Uh, so that's the point is we're pivoting into things that are mm -hmm. actually selling and putting people back to work. That's the yeah. That's the uh, and that makes the sense. And the and, and the, the scale that you work at, and when you've got multiple businesses, this is I think what people don't always understand. It, it's nice having the diversified income, it's nice to have multiple businesses. I have three. When COVID hit, I'm running in three different directions trying to plug holes and work out what to do. I, I don't work at your scale, but I'm imagining it's a similar kind of thing when you've got multiple businesses and something like COVID hits, you can't in the UK just furlough everyone. There are there are rules, regulations, where's and why's of what how things are impact. So you have to kind of separate your mind into these different jurisdictions and go, right. That needs that focus there. That needs that focus there, and that needs that focus there. But they're all fires that need to be put out, so they all look the, uh, like top of mind, right? That's the most important point. They're all fires, right? Yeah. And you just have to figure out which one is threatening the this entire city first, yeah. right? And yeah. so, well, as you jump between these things, and and I have to say, it's not easy. And I I know a lot of people. They're like, well, you know, hey, I'm starting my Amazon business, and I'm going to start another brand, and another brand, and another brand. And I'm like, hey, pump the brakes for a minute. You mm -hmm. know, start your first brand, get it together, um, get some additional products in that brand, right? Mm -hmm. Really make that brand flourish. Um, you may have to pivot like me in some cases. Uh, if you're selling travel goods right now, probably not a hot product category. There's yeah. many other examples, by the way, of, mm -hmm. of uh, items in dress. Yet for as many of those areas that are taking punishment, there's mm -hmm. plenty of areas of opportunity. And that's part yeah. of what we're gonna talk about today which is how do I know where to go? How do I know where to pivot? And hmm. it, by the way, it's not rocket science. There's data out there. We're going to share a lot of that data yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. and I have to just read the tea leaves and make my best guess. Yeah. And that's all you can do is do your best. You put your best foot forward. At the end of the day, in the boxing term, they say you leave it all in the ring. Yeah. So do you want to share your screen and let's go through some of this data? Yeah. So if, if there are... Um, uh, folks out there who want to follow along uh, the, for the awesomers, uh, awesomers.com yeah. slash 192. We've prepared some uh, graphics and graphs. I'm going to share that screen, uh, awesomers.com slash 192. And let's see here. Don't share these tips. Mm -hmm. Share this screen. Bear with me. 
Okay, so let me know if you can see the screen coming up, Danny. There we go. Yep, got it. Okay, so uh, awesomers.com slash 192. Let's talk about the first thing. So first, let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, the Channel Advisor Company is a, is a large uh, publicly traded SaaS company that has many, many clients, thousands of, of customers. Their software is very, very expensive. Um, and for certain people, it's a great fit. I ha happen to be a subscriber and I have what I've even termed with the CEO of Channel Advisor, a love-hate relationship with Channel Advisor. It is often hate, but there's parts of it that I love. And yeah. uh, and so I, I flip flop back and forth. So do I think uh, this is not a commercial for Channel Advisor, by the way. Mm. It's not right for 99% of the sellers listen to this, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, but they have put together some very good data and I've linked to it on the page and I've also pulled some excerpts out for us to talk about. Cool. Sounds good? Sounds good. Let's get into it. All right. So this is the first question they ask. And by the way, they ask a thousand consumers these questions. And they said, since the outbreak of coronavirus uh, at the start of March, what has happened with your, your shopping frequency as it pertains to online shopping? And you can see by demographics, there's been an increase. And it averages, um, I don't know if it's an average or a medium, but 46% of customers are shopping online more frequently. Hmm. And you can see by age group, um, in, in every possible category, it's gone up. And I, I don't think it's a surprise that the younger people are shopping more online than the older people. What about you, Danny? Any surprises? No, no, there? no. There's no surprises there. But it's, it's just interesting that the 18 to 25, I'd have thought that would be natural that they're shopping online anyway. But 62% is a jump, isn't it? That's the point, right? So that, mm. that's so if you first look at it, you're like, well, of course, the young is uh, increased uh, even more than the old. But if you actually parse it back and go, wait a minute, why weren't the 18 to 25s already shopping like crazy? Yeah, that's, what, yeah that's my point. Right? That, that's high, your, yeah. yeah. It's the highest that assumption number. is reasonable, mm. but how did they have the biggest jump? Well, that tells us our assumption of they're already shopping online, not necessarily correct. Mm. Um, by the way, that we do have to factor in the, the fact that the truth of it is when there are an absence of options, in other words, the main street, high street stores are closed, that you are left without choices. So yeah. that doesn't mean this behavior is um, anything more than, or it might imply that the, it's just a simple lack of options. That's the, that's what I'm getting at. Make yeah. sense? Yeah, for the benefit of the podcast, obviously, because this is oh, visual. thank you, good point. This this go eighteen to twenty five year olds is sixty two percent, twenty six to thirty five is fifty seven, thirty six to forty five is forty seven, forty six to fifty five is thirty six percent, fifty six to sixty five is forty one, and those over the age of sixty six years is at thirty eight percent. All of those are increases, and very good point for yeah. those listeners. Um, the, the summary is 46% of consumers are shopping online more frequently as a result of the COVID. And now that starts to ask a whole series of secondary questions like, well, will that last? What happens when High Street opens and, and on and on? So, um, and by the way, I would just like to invite the folks out there listening. If you have questions as we go through this, yeah. jump on in here. Let's make this interactive, uh, especially today as we're kind of interpreting this stuff live along with you. Uh, what do you yeah. think about that, Danny? Sounds good. I'll say hello to some of the guys in the feed. Sahel's here, Austin's here, Dan O'Connor, Kevin Dickinson's rejoining, Herb is back with us, Christine is here, Dimitri Hasing, Tomas Yal Cabelli is back, Yelchin says hello guys, Andrew Kramer is also here, Side B said good afternoon people, more COVID, that's what we need, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, I hear a lot of familiar names. Welcome back, everybody. Let yeah. me just uh, get on to our next bit here. So um, this is now it's a question. of how. So we talked about how much are they shopping online? Now the question is, are they spending more time or less time online and by what device? Mm -hmm. So uh, Danny, why don't you take us through the uh, the breakdown here between device? So we've got laptop and desktop computers, 50 Four percent more time. Thirty-nine percent is uh, the same amount of time, and less uh, time is five percent. Then tablets and mobile devices is more at fifty-two percent. Forty at some uh, the same amount of five percent less time. Social media channels is an increase of thirty-six percent more time. Forty-two percent same amount of time, and eight percent 
less amount of time. So here at the bottom is 58% of 26 to 35 year olds are spending more time on social media channels. Then at 63%, 18 to 25 year olds are spending more time on mobile devices. Do you think this comes down to people being off school? There's, there's, it's the compounded effect in terms of homeschooling. Let's be honest, homeschooling is what, two hours for some people, if that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, but saying that 18, 25 year olds, I'm, they're not going to be at school. They're going to be more of a uh, university level stuff, but yeah. It's interesting know. to me. One of the things that for, I was surprised now, I don't understand why channel advisor put tablets and mobile devices together. I would have put tablets with desktops or something because mm -hmm. the, the mobile and basically 54% of people on laptop and desktop spending more time online, 52 on tablets and mobile, that's essentially the same number. Let's assume a plus or minus 2% variance in the polling samples here. That's the same thing, whereas I would have thought that mobile devices were driving higher during this time period. I, I don't know why, because if people are home, they have access to these things. But um, that, that basically tells me my assumption is probably wrong. In, in fact, that the the larger devices kind of had the same numbers as mobile devices, whereas I do believe that the stats at the bottom, that the younger people are driven to the mobile devices. My kids, they're not shopping online. You know, they play their games online. They watch YouTube online on their desktops or laptops or what have you. But everything else is through their mobile device. Is that your yep. presumption uh, I, as well? I agree with that. I just want to say there's a couple of people commented in the feed. Roger Percy, the cheeky sod, he says, I'm in the 36 category. Which one are you in, Steve? I think he's referring to the age group on the previous slides, cheeky sod. First of all, how dare you? And yeah. uh, I'm 50, so you can find me in that age group, yes. Okay, Dan O'Connor says, hello from Thailand, gents. And Kevin Dickinson says, my opinion, I don't think physical retail is even close to being dead in the long term, this seems to be a myth being spread around. What's your take on that? I like Kevin. He always comes up with controversial ways of looking at stuff. Uh, we know it's not fully dead, but we do know that there's been a bump in the direction since COVID. That we've been forcing people to shop online, which is speed up some of the pro process of online shopping. But what's your take on that, Steve? Well, I think we'll get into some more of those uh, answers to those questions. The reality is, you know, um, traditional retail, high street, grocery, whatever, those are never going to disappear. Yeah. But they do have to change. This is a, a conversation I've been having for over 20 years in the, mm -hmm. the online space. You know, Toys R Us died because it didn't evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, these types of companies are going to die if they don't evolve. And yeah. Walmart is desperately trying to evolve. Right yeah. now, they have a massive scale and a, a moat built around that business that does more than a billion dollars a day. So they've got some time to get it right. But it, they are trying to evolve, whereas so there's so many other companies that inside those companies, it's a fight between the people who own the balance sheets, the P&Ls for the land-based business and the online business. And honestly, they have to mash them up together. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. If you're not omni-channel, you're going to be no channel at some point. Yeah. Be where the customers want you to be. That is uh, a message that I've been sharing for 20 years. Be where the customers want you to be. And as brand owners for you Amazon sellers, I tell you the same thing. Start where you have to with the Amazon Cornerstone and then build as you can into mm. various sales channels, wherever it makes sense for your brand. Makes Good? sense. Yeah. All right. Let's get on to the next one here. Um, all right, so people now, uh, so th now this is a question about time on Marketplace. I'm trying to zoom in here for you, but it's not playing along. So we'll just pretend it's it's close enough. So are you spending more or time, sh more or less time shopping on Amazon? Uh, take us through those numbers, Danny. So with Amazon, more time is at 39%. Uh, same amount of time is 46 and less time is 11%. Now, looking at non-Amazon uh, marketplaces, including eBay, Walmart, etc., you're looking at more time at 34%, same amount of time at 47 and less time at 12 So the numbers, are, they're quite steady on both sets of platforms, aren't they? If you extrapolate from one to another, they're pretty much the same. Very, very close. And, and I think that would surprise a lot of people mm. that, you know, we're all uh, proclaiming Amazon as a great victor uh, in this uh, COVID situation. And certainly they have come out 
uh, smelling pretty good uh, when it comes to a business performance, notwithstanding all the problems they they have faced. And some of those problems trickled into the sellers, right? We got we couldn't send stuff in. They couldn't keep up. Uh, there's all kinds of things that have happened during this time, but the, more than just Amazon one, we actually saw our sales explode on eBay hmm. and, and do quite well, uh, or excuse me, explode on Walmart and do quite well on eBay. But we uh, had this discussion before, I think it was you and I, we, we touched on it that because of the non-essential goods thing, Amazon were running out of products. Therefore people had to look at alternative channels. So Shopify see a big uplift and so did the other channels. So it's weird to look at those numbers and, and not see the spikes that suggest. Well, that's, that's again, so we made this assumption that because of Amazon's struggles to keep things in stock and, mm -hmm. and put prime shipping a month away, that yeah. the, all these other channels would benefit. But ultimately, the people said we spend 46% 46, 46 of people said we spend the same amount of time on Amazon. 47% said we spend the same amount of time on the other channels. Really, it doesn't even sound like any much changed. You know, there is a third of people roughly that did increase their time between both those different alternatives in, in terms of marketplaces. So there's not there's no indication based on this data point that Amazon was the runaway winner. That's yeah. that's kind of my point. Yeah. And All also that means talking, is online. And, and if you take into things where, like in the UK, if someone's furloughed and they're on 80% of their wages, although they're spending less by not traveling outside of the house, they may not have spent money on non essential items at the very beginning. They just stuck to the essential goods. So even though when they went to Amazon, they were looking for the essential goods and the non essential goods they weren't worried about anyway. And I'm sure that Amazon would have had a plan and the data to look at some of that as well because of the changing habits. Therefore, that's why they push to focus more solely on the essential items. Yeah, quite right. And I think uh, not only is that data point right, it's also right from a, a, a human perspective, right? Mm. All of us have to focus on what do we need the most? Uh, that term mm. essential is actually legitimate. So here is where some of our assumptions are proven to be true. Uh, if you take a look, the next data point says, you know what, of the 26 to 35 year olds, mm. they are shopping on Amazon more frequently by a count of 54%. Mm. So once you start zooming into an age group, the, that's you know closest to the, the millennial uh, zone, they are, they've, you know, 54% of them are shopping on Amazon more frequently. That yeah. is a big win for Amazon as a as a emerging age group. Yeah. Uh, and go ahead and take them through the, the next bit over there on the so right. So we're looking at 28% of 56 to 65 year olds are shopping uh, on non Amazon marketplaces more frequently. So, so that what in my opinion, that means that uh, in that age group, those other marketplaces lost ground to mm -hmm. Amazon. Right, because if the average was 34% more time over all age groups and 56 to 65 were only 28%, that means they've lost ground uh, in that particular age group, probably to Amazon. Yeah. So there are some sectors, ironically, in the older group and kind of the, the millennial group that, that Amazon is overperforming. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that Amazon <laughs> knows all this already. Yeah. Uh, the competitors probably know it too. So, um, all right, so since the outbreak of coronavirus, the start of March, this is how people have discovered products. And I find this to be interesting um, that, you know, we all assume that everybody and the, the world revolves around Amazon. Is that a fair assumption? I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. painting with I a mean, broad brush world, here. But. Just, yeah, in our world, they think the world re revolves around Amazon. But just to interject there, I'll give you one example. This is from me going out on the road speaking. Amazon is a tiny, tiny aspect of when you go to like these big commerce events, like Amazon is, is treated as a channel in our world, it's everything, right? So I might go and speak at an event. I'll give an example. I spoke at the, there's an SEO conference in uh, Brighton in England last year. Main stage, three and a half thousand. I was up in literally, it was the, the bar upstairs stroke cloakroom of a stage for 120 people for the Amazon section. That's how it can get treated. And then if you go to like these major events at Excel and stuff, Amazon, again, plays a small role. So it's very interesting to step outside of your domain to realize there's a bigger world out there. It is true. And I, I see this regularly as I go to various events that are not Amazon centric. 
And that's that's part of the point of this uh, podcast is mm -hmm. to remind us that there's other things. And this particular graphic tells us exactly how people are finding products online. And uh, why don't you take them through some of the numbers if you can, Danny? Okay, so we're looking here. Browsing retail brand websites is at 46%. Browsing marketplaces is at 30. Word of mouth is increased to 24%. That's interesting. Social media, 22. TV and streaming ads at 17. Google ads, 17. But I think Amazon spent a lot less in terms of Google recently in the last six months. Social media ads, 16%. Marketplace ads, 15%. Other internet ads is 11% and other is at nine. So just for those who are doing the math, yes, this adds up to more than 100%. This is going to be one of those options where they ask the participants, how have you discovered products that you've purchased yeah. online? So this is key. This is product discovery that actually led to a purchase online. Yeah. And here's how they did it. And they would click multiple ones. And you mm. could see all those different things. So, you know, we talk about, Facebook ads all the time, right? And Instagram mm -hmm. ads. Uh, but that's the same as Google ads, right? Yeah. And and this is a thing people often forget. And with the Amazon attribution uh, pixel now, it's like, mm -hmm. why aren't you doing some of these other types of things? Why aren't you you know, mm -hmm. testing these things? And I am surprised to see the marketplace ads so high that people actually recognize it's a marketplace ad. Yeah. That one, yeah. I, I, I'm a little suspect on. What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting one. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I want to go to a question here. Sorry, because I'm, sure. I don't want to move around too much, but it's very interesting. People, it spiked their interest in terms of, I'll give you an example. So Dana uh, Donald said, this is not, uh, this is just what people respond to in the poll, right? Not based on analytics. I wonder if the, if some people might think they're spending the same time, but actually spending more time or vice versa, et cetera. People can be pretty bad at answering polls, even if they tend to tell the truth. Just a thought, what do you think, guys? Valid point? Oh, very valid, yeah. Um, yeah people, they don't actually know. Um, so I, I think it's instructive, mm. and it, it tells us how people feel about what's happening. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what they're doing. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So mm. there was this uh, famous study where, uh, essentially the psychologists were trying to see if they could implant a memory. Yeah. And so they called in this group and they, they basically talked about a bunch of nonsense. And the, the way they did this is they said, everybody, uh, when you come in, you got to fill out this questionnaire. And so they made sure that everybody who walked in the room and they were going to get a hundred dollars for the questionnaire today and a hundred dollars mm -hmm. a questionnaire, uh, for uh, a year from now. Yeah. And the quick version is, they made sure everybody had been to Disneyland. And before the, the quote interview about the questionnaire started, before the official part uh, from the perspective of the participants started, they would just come in and schmooze with them a little. And they're like, oh, hey, uh, have you ever been to Disneyland? Knowing mm -hmm. full well they had been to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And the people are like, yeah, yeah, I've been to Disneyland. And they're like, oh, oh, did you get a cuddle from um, Daffy Duck, right? And and the people, you know, some people say yes and some people say no. and. Uh, and then they would carry on with the fake part of the thing, right? So the, from the participant perspective, it was an hour of nonsense uh, or an hour of real nutty stuff for the participants. So they didn't uh, take into consideration this implanted memory. Fast yeah. forward one year, and this goes to uh, the point made by our uh, participant there. Okay. One year later, they uh, do the same thing, a big, long questionnaire all about nonsense. They bring them in and they schmooze them and they go, hey, uh, have you ever been to Disneyland? Again, knowing that they have and they've already answered yes before. Hmm. And they said, you know, what do you remember? So open-ended question. What do you remember? And they go, oh, I remember getting a cuddle from Daffy Duck. And uh, so already you go, well, maybe some did, maybe some didn't. But Daffy Duck is not part of the Disney world. That's a Warner yeah. Brothers property, right? Hmm. Nobody got a cuddle from Daffy Duck. The point is nobody – can be responsible for their own memory, uh, even when they think they're good at it. Yeah. But why I still like this sort of data is because it gives us a sense of what people think. 
Yes, the steer. fact that they can recognize it, aren't you? Yeah. Um, so good, good points. So we've got here as well, uh, Kevin Dickinson again. As a as of before COVID, Amazon is five percent of all retail. All the gurus twist the data to fool the people. I don't know what that means. He can probably explain himself. So much opportunity beyond Amazon and all the bogus uh, IP related risks associated with being on Amazon. Steve, a girl says, Kevin Dixon, I agree. It's just a shift in allocations and supply chain. Uh, supply chains are in demand is still there. Yeah, I, in general, uh, you know, demand is going to take uh, variations based on essentials and, and based on money and, and disposable income and applicability mm. of their lifestyle at this moment. Uh, but you're right. I, I think you know, as long as people can get back to work and, and keep the income flowing. Uh, yeah. What was the percentage you said, Danny? The He's saying here, as yeah. of before COVID, Amazon is 5% of all retail. And he's right. You know, where there's a guru, there's a twist, isn't there? And they will fool the people. Our goal here is just to share data and spark interest, conversation, people to educate themselves, and they can extrapolate as as they wish from the data That's that right. we're yeah. looking at. Yeah. Yep. And uh, just for those uh, who want to run along with us, you can go to awesomers.com slash 192 and see this stuff and scroll around as you as you like. Uh, you want to dive into this next one, Danny? So product research. Have you researched products on any of these sites? So we've got Facebook, Instagram, Google Shopping, and, of course, Amazon. So the first one is suggestion here. I'm not sure how to read this chart, actually. You're saying here 13 because it's so small. Sorry. No, no Sorry. problem. Let me help, let me jump in and help you because I have a larger version. So okay. on the, the question is, have you researched products on Facebook to start off with? 57% of people say no. Okay. 13% of people say I don't even use Facebook. And 30% of people said, yes, I do product research on Facebook. Yeah. And I'm just going to jump over for a clean comparison to Amazon's numbers. 82% of people says, yes, I've researched products on Amazon, right? Yeah. This is, again, not a surprise to Amazon shoppers or Amazon sellers. 13% uh, say, no, uh, mm. I, I don't uh, do product research on Amazon. I don't even know how that's possible. Maybe they just have recurring subscribe and save stuff. And then 4% of people, only 4% say they don't use Amazon at all. So that's that's a very interesting contrast for people's perception about are you researching product between these two things? Yeah. Um, but does that make sense to you? You want to? Uh, do you know what's interesting? There's no Pinterest here. When you it think is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at the bottom, because a lot of the relation around Pinterest, I mean, it's a heavily female-led market, as I understand, in terms of the buyers and the pins and stuff. But there is a good place where uh, a lot of age groups will go to Pinterest to do research. But what's interesting here is 8% of 18 to 25-year-olds have researched products on Instagram, which I'm assuming they're doing that purely through hashtags and, and following influencers. I, I have to agree with that. Like, I really, I want to research what the word research means in this context, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't understand. Like, yeah. if you're on Instagram and you see somebody who has a, whatever, a backpack or a purse or shoes or whatever it is, I, I'm not a uh, great Instagram shopper, but... It, I wouldn't call that research. I would call that kind of passive entertainment that you also happen to, mm. you know, see a product placement. But yeah. this young group, 18 to 25 year olds, say 80% of their research, whatever that means, mm. is based around Instagram, which I find fascinating. Which is a picture. So the depth of their research is. <laughs> superficial <laughs> you, you, you can go into that <laughs> one yourself uh kevin's back again he's talking about here he goes youtube gurus uh amazon is 50 percent of all e-commerce buy my 10k course i just hit a mill last month i mean you can't really argue with that can you that is a lot of uh if you do a search on youtube you will probably find a lot of videos uh trying to give the big one in that sense and they are probably nowhere near any of that uh so b says you're going back to earlier on what's interesting here about the browsing is quite high and the ads are pretty low might suggest that seo and organic searches are more important that refers to the slide above browsing retail brand websites at 46 percent yes i so you know how did they find those retail brand and websites how did they find um you know where to start that browsing i don't know mm -hmm. i would presume it's search engine oriented I, I can tell you that search engine optimization, that's the SEO, remains yeah. important because 
no matter how people think that they are interacting with the internet, yeah. they are searching it, right? Amazon mm -hmm. is a search engine at the end of the day. That's why relevance mm -hmm. to your keywords and your listing, all of that, if, if you're not doing that, you are not gonna be found on Amazon or Google or you know, could just go down the line to wh whomever you wish. Well, any, and, any search or intent platform where you have to type in the keywords, you're not gonna be found unless you optimize it. Right, and let's just let's take a moment, and I'm not going to get too ethereal here, but hmm. people, uh, not people, but search engines now are baking into their algorithms personalized intent predictors. Hmm. Yeah. So based on the images you see, based on the videos you watch, based on what you've purchased in the past, they're going to make assumptions on that auto, you know, suggestion yeah. box what they think that you personally are interested hmm. in, not just. You know, if I type in, you know, ASD, whatever, and you type it in, we could get totally different suggestions based on our own histories. And that takes into consideration the pictures we're seeing, the videos we're watching, the purchases mm. we're making, the places we're browsing, all of those things. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, it's in some ways maybe scary, but that's the reality of it. Indeed. So, uh, so I think product research, here. the only other um, interesting thing to me is that 79% of consumers over 56 years old uh, have researched products on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So in, in many ways, this it indicates that the older audience is very comfortable doing their product research on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think this is a you know good thing, bad thing per se. I just think it's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah, no, no difference there. The only thing I can think of is that they've got more opportunity now if a lot more people, I don't know what percentage is, but if everyone's using enhanced brand content now or a mass increase of that, that gives them opportunity to understand a bit more about the product, about the brand and the story behind the brand. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that's fair. I do think that there are things that are going to happen with product research vis-a-vis uh, -vis Google mm. and Facebook uh, and all of these places that are trying to bolt on marketplaces. There will be some changes in how yeah. people find things, uh, yeah. but they're not there yet. Uh, all right. Now, this is where it gets interesting to me because now it's like, where did you purchase products? Mm. So, and this is, again, potentially instructive. Maybe some people are confused about where they're actually making purchases, uh, which I think we'll see in a minute. But uh, Danny, can you see those numbers? You want me to try? Yeah. To so with Facebook, we've got don't use at thirteen point nine. Yes, which is twenty five point five percent, and sixty point six is a no. Then on Instagram, uh, fifty two point four percent is no. Then don't use is twenty four point two, and then yes is twenty three point four. And these are all increases, right? No, this is, have you made a purchase on right. any of these sites? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and then Google Shopping is, yes, is 29.7. No, is 52.5. And don't use is 17.8. And finally, Amazon, 60.8% is yes, 35% no, and then 4.2 is do not use. So this, again, to me, is absolutely instructive. And I would say, uh, you know, from our point earlier about mm. the, the, you know, applicability of, of, you know, Amazon or not Amazon or, you know, young versus old, this is very clear. People yeah. go to Amazon to make purchases, right? Yeah. They don't go to Facebook to make purchases. That's not why you go there, mm. but it is entirely why you go to Amazon. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, there's nobody on Amazon. I don't know if this takes into consideration prime streamers or any of the rest of it, but Amazon is there to make a purchase. Facebook is there to kind of distract yourself. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One's a social, one's a commerce. Yeah, same with Instagram. You got yeah. social versus commerce. Now, Google Shopping is kind of the tweener, right? Mm. It's trying to be shopping, but people don't go to Google just to shop. They go to that kind of discovery and search concept. Yeah, well, it, orga it, it organizes the world's information. So that's where normally you start your search process. But what is interested, though, is that when you look at that, when you think of Google Shopping and people running ads, it's saying yes, which is 29.7. But then on Instagram, it's out by, what, 6% or so with a yes at 23.4, which is really interesting. Right? Like we said, you start research there, plus it doubles up as commerce platform, plus it's got the strongest PPC engine in the world and is renowned that everyone follows. Yeah, and I know I'm not relying on Google Shopping. That's just one of the ad 
uh, types that served. But it's interesting how much difference there is, is very little between that Instagram and Facebook, Google Shopping versus two social sites. Yeah, that I find interesting as well. And I have to say that this is one of the areas that I question the respondents hmm. because how many times have you purchased something on Facebook, Danny? Very rare. Maybe twice through this pandemic. Maybe I bought some stuff for me bald spot on my head and a little roller to go on my head for me hair to grow, but that's it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you get a lot of these junky ads, don't you? That come up they you. are a lot of junky ads, but but yeah. actually transacting on Facebook, no. I think it's ultra low right now. Very much so, yeah. Right, besides yeah, the yeah. hair product category, which I'm a big fan of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think that was a personal shot, everybody. Um, yeah. Danny's picking on me. No, yeah. Instagram, I've also, now again, I'm not the perfect target audience for either of these two things, but I've never made a purchase on Facebook or Instagram in the native platform mm. myself. I yeah. can't imagine how a quarter of the people have, honestly. Do, do you think that's right or wrong? No, no, I don't so believe that. I think they may have just let in and go, well, did you see something on Facebook or mm. Instagram that led to a purchase? Yeah. I think that's kind of more directional. So this is one where Google Shopping has to outperform a social site, in my opinion, I for transactions. So, but... Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, what do we know? We just know this is what people are, are talking about. Now, I do want to say that uh, on the bottom, it says 65% of 18 to 25 year olds have purchased products on Instagram after mm -hmm. seeing the ads or posts. So that's, that's um, maybe conducive to what I just uh, proposed earlier, which is, yeah, they saw something and then they acted on it. Yeah. Tim Kramer says, oh, sorry. Mm, no, please. Yeah, Tim Cramer says, haha, these numbers are probably going to change with some new Shopify and Facebook integrations. Our shop just got the ability to sell directly on FB and IG. But well, that's good. More channels that open up, especially social channels to sell on. That's fantastic. Like you were saying earlier on, this diversification of risk. You start on Amazon, you build out off of that channel, you get cash flow, and you start to build out the other channels to diversify your risk. Totally right. And, you know, to Tim's point, now, you know, Shopify and WooCommerce, they all have these integrations where you can pot, put your stuff on the Facebook, you can put your stuff on Instagram, Pinterest. There are other channels as well that make it pretty seamless for you. So the orders come in and aggregate on your shopping platform of choice. Again, Shopify, WooCommerce, what have you. And then you can uh, even tie those fulfillments if you really need to into Amazon or a third party warehouse. And so the the heavy lifting is very low compared to having to stock a bunch for different channels. So I think that's very useful. Cool. Uh, final note on this slide, 63% yes. of 18 to 25 year olds have purchased products on Amazon after seeing ads. Hmm. Now, I don't know if they're talking about Amazon ads or ads on the social shopping platforms, but it does just tell us that ads have an impact on shopping behavior. Mm -hmm. which we kind of knew, but it's nice to hear. Don't you agree? Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, when this when was this poll done? Because last year there was a switch where uh, there was a lot of, especially on desktop, right? The, there was a lot more um, sponsored ads at the top of the page pushing down the organic, so that could skew some of the data as well. Well, this was uh, conducted in May, uh, so it's because it's pandemic related yeah 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 okay so yeah that's fine then because obviously with them updates there that's where the data could be skewed it depends on their device what they're looking on of course but if you look at desktop most of the categories you're going to see four or five sponsored ads there at the top well and again this is where you kind of wonder do the consumers even know that they're clicking on ads i know you know mm. a lot of times it has the little descriptors but they they now make those ads look so native to the mm. shopping experience whether it's google or amazon or the rest of them yeah. that it's hard to tell the difference between the ads and not ads um, yeah, yeah and so let's see tim ask a question i can actually see it says to clarify they actually complete checkout native on facebook and instagram apps i i totally get it tim i'm with yeah. you 100 percent those yeah. uh we've had that ability we were in the beta for facebook uh for uh, some time maybe 18 months and we've transacted business on Facebook that uh, we didn't have the ability to transact before that then flows into those uh, platforms for fulfillment. Is that, you kind of agree with me? You can yep. let me know in the comments. Cool. Okay, last uh, couple topics here. Uh, 
So we this is not a giant surprise probably that essential items are our top sellers, but essential beauty is outselling essential medical supplies. <laughs> That's a little bit of a surprise to me. What's your thoughts? Yeah, but what side, <laughs> male or female beauty? Well, it's uh, it's yeah. a fair question. And, and, and the what, fact that they what, put toothpaste what? on the top of that as beauty yeah. product, I'm not sure I would agree yeah. with that. But Yeah, no, there's toothpaste and toothbrush. Yeah, so essential beauty. Yeah, I don't know. Medical supplies. I don't even know what essential me. beauty is. Yeah, nor do I. I mean, I have to have some foundation. That's for sure. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah um, no, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to say about that because what, 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 what is essential beauty? Is beard oil essential beauty? No. You, uh, well, it's you, essential for you, Danny. Yes. Yeah. And again, me, do, yeah. I like a little blush with a follow by, you know, foundation, a little yeah. blush, and just kind of keep it real. Hmm. Um, I, I do think that books and hobbies. Uh, 27 percent have uh, purchased these items since the beginning of march 2020 this mm -hmm. is not a surprise but it is a confirmation that uh you know people are buying these things on yeah. a more frequent basis yeah. uh and so as we just kind of dive into um the next bit here and, and i'll mm -hmm. just start us and then you can finish us on this um cool. so covid the COVID crisis seems to have accelerated consumer behavior trends that we've already started to see. And that's kind of the point. We've seen some of these shifts to Amazon and to online in general, but this has accelerated that. So from the data below, there are patterns that have been occurring in the past, but are now increasing in terms of their pace. Hmm. And we're also going to find out what helps people drive their decisions. So since the outbreak of coronavirus, um, do you want to take them through those uh, circles? Yeah, 30, stats? thirty-one percent of consumers purchased items that have never bought online before. Then uh, twenty percent of consumers purchase items from retailers they haven't shopped with before. Another twenty percent of consumers have more confidence purchasing online than ever before. And then finally, thirty-four percent of consumers are happy to wait longer for the delivery of non-essential goods. That's really interesting. Thirty-four percent. Yeah, I, so there's a bunch of stuff on there that are real headlines, honestly. So first of all, they're happy to wait for delivery, you know, longer for delivery. How long they'll be happy about that, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I think that could be a temporary, you know, I get it, the sky is falling, we'll give you an extra couple of days to make that delivery. That's a, that is probably a temporary effect. But the fact that 20% of consumers purchase items from retailers they've never shopped at before, or that 31% have purchased items they had never bought before online. That is a behavioral acceleration that I really think has promised for the online community. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of things just quickly to just before we get away from this. Kevin made a good point. Essential beauty includes haircuts, shaving, makes sense. So I, I, I agree with that is that, you know, beard trimmers, um, people doing their own haircuts at home, you know, they call it the COVID cut. Where everyone's having their hair shaved off because they can't get out to like a hairdressers like for men so then obviously you've got the women's essential items which we don't need to go into but you know what i mean on monthly cycles etc these are still essential goods uh for women i suppose toothpaste going back to it is beauty in the fact that you know you want clean teeth but um yeah i did notice on amazon that uh hair clippers when i was researching and beard clippers were out of stock here in the uk and i had to buy one of those dodgy drop shipping ones off uh, PayPal that took about six weeks to get here. So, yes. <laughs> uh, well, it's always nice to have a dodgy uh, beard and hair trimmer. Um, so I, I definitely see that, you know, there, there are some temporary effects from, you know, people running out of stock. I'm sure there's people listening to this podcast right yeah. now mm -hmm. that had hot products and ran out of stock. If there are, you guys go ahead and jump in the comments. Tell us about it. Uh, Danny, why don't you take us through this next bit here? So how do you predict that the current COVID-19 outbreak will affect your future purchasing habits? I will shop online more than before is a quote here. So 18 to 25-year-olds is 55%. 26 to 35 is 51 36 to 45 is 43 46 to 55 is 37 and 56 to 65 year olds is 31 percent and finally those above 66 years is at 21 percent so as you look at the, all of that data in aggregate 38 percent of u.s consumers predict they will shop more online than they did before the pandemic 38 percent is a massive shift 
Hmm. Now, I don't know if they'll actually follow through with it or not, but if their intent and their openness to shopping more online, 38% are willing to shop more online in the future than they did before. That has epic proportions of good happening. And uh, whoever was talking about the the people, you know, the the uh, so-called gurus out there, wait till they spin those numbers, man. They are going to have a field yeah. day with those. Well, numbers. they might listen to this and then cook the numbers off of this one to sell to more <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what did uh, there's uh, some great quote that uh, 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 lies and statistics are more or less the same thing. But uh, yeah, the 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 do the thing I want people to take note of here that the younger crowd, which we all assumed was already pretty online centric, at least mm-hmm. I did. I, yeah. I won't make assumptions for the rest of you, but the comfort, the security, the awareness, the just ability, right, for the young people, um, this. I thought was already there and but 18 to 25 year olds say yes you know what 55 percent will shop online more than before 26 to 35 51 percent and it descends in terms of the increase from there but the areas i thought were strongest are likely to have the largest increases yeah yeah um okay so i i think that one is really really an optimistic chart if you guys aren't paying attention this is the one that go back and play back in slow motion and just know that the massive increases that you've seen online, everybody who talks about, oh, my gosh, I should have been here in 2015, 2016, 2017 and lamenting the past. Forget about it. You're in the right place at the right time. The future is bright. Yeah. Even if it was at 20 percent, it would still be good. Four percent is epic <laughs> numbers, right? Yeah. This yeah. is the point. And we're yeah. 10x that. We are yeah. a you know, an entire, uh, you know, threshold higher. So, um, okay. So how do you predict the current COVID-19 outbreak will affect your future grocery purchasing habits? So this is grocery purchasing. Mm -hmm. And of those who said, I will shop for groceries online more than I did before. Danny, take us through. 18 to 25 is 37%, 26 to 35 is 39, 36 to 45 is 28. Then you've got 46 to 55 year olds, which is 20%. And it drops down here at 56 to 65 year olds, which is 17. And the lowest number on the chart is 60 years, 66 years and above at 15%. Yeah. And, you know, I think, again, this is where the, the younger crowd rightly and expectedly says, you know what, I will just do more grocery shopping online, hmm. certainly more than the older crowd. But again, this idea that they can grow 37, 39% over what they're already doing just shows that there is some, I don't know, latent effect when you've sampled it due to necessity during the pandemic. You've said, I kind of like that. Why should I bother going to the grocery store or Costco or whatever? I'm going to send you know, the app people to go, go, go do my shopping for me. That is a behavior shift. That's a good thing. Yeah. I agree. Then this is kind of the, the uh, final kind of data point. And then we can uh, parse this out with the folks. uh, Which of the following are the biggest influences when choosing products since the lockdown? Now, in fairness, we don't have comparison data pre lockdown, Mm. But this is what people say since the lockdown. Here's what's driving and influencing their purchasing decision the most. Danny. Price is 68%. Product availability is 56 Delivery speed is 35 Reviews, 29 which is interesting. Brand name is 24 which at 24% is quite high, I think. Flexibility of delivery time is 18%. And payment options, 16 I mean, price is obviously people be sensitive, especially by – non-essential goods they're they're looking you know 99 percent of the planet might be looking that we're going into recession so price understand i understand product availability 50 56 percent but deliver uh delivery speed 35 percent i is is quite low i think because of the expectation and the fact that you're home and being frustrated you know you've you literally you've seen the memes go around where you you all just sank on amazon and they're staring out the window through the glass you know so yeah, I think I would have seen uh, delivery speed higher, especially when it comes to a few months ago, On especially for people with PPC, et cetera, when you had these delay times of three or four weeks, massive impact on conversions. No no question about it. And and mm. this is, this is if for anybody who's really paying close attention here, 
Uh, Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon in whatever it was, 1994, cool. 1995, he said, we're going to do three things that make us a, a really important business. We're going to have the lowest prices. Hmm. We're going to have the most products. And we're going to deliver and have the fastest and have obsessive customer service. Those three pillars, 20 plus years later, are still what people care the most about. And that is a very important lesson for all of you shoppers out there. And mm -hmm. most importantly, for all of you sellers. Hmm. I, I, I'm surprised uh, by the review percentage being so low, but I think that's a secondary factor after price. Or do you think opinion. that sensitivity of is a common thing in our industry in terms of Amazon being suspended reviews, the, the, the mainstays, right? Ranking, getting to page one, reviews and suspension. So I think maybe we overestimate reviews. I don't know. Maybe the consumer behavior since the bad press come out on Amazon of fake reviews has gone down and therefore availability and speed takes precedent. Well, clearly it does based on what cu customers are telling us. Yeah. You know, I can say that there are multiple factors. So hmm. they may only consider a product after they qualify the price, the availability, it's in stock, and hmm. I can get it within a few days. And then they look at reviews, right? Yeah. So this can be hierarchical in mm -hmm. some sense. Yeah. Uh, but I tell you, if you're Procter & Gamble, this is terrible news for you mm. because brand name is at the very end of this tale of influence. Yeah. And the head of the influence is all about things that we can all compete in, right? Mm. All of us that are making brands to compete with those big boys around the world, these multinational, multi-billion dollar global companies, these guys don't have anything, no advantage over us, right? Yeah. They just don't. If we can compete on these factors and Amazon as a cornerstone and even some of these other channels now have the uh, applicability to help us with price, speed, and availability. Yeah. Cool. It's Should really we, good news we, for us. Yeah. Are we done with the shared screen? Yep, I think so. Oh. Cool. Right. So uh, there is a question here. Uh, Yelchin says, my question to Steve, he said on Facebook that he registered for an EPA, Environment Protection Agency, in the USA to sell pesticides. Could you guys please share any attorneys or lawyers give the service to register EPA to sell pesticides? Thanks. Uh, just just do a search, find somebody in your local area who knows about uh, EPA stuff. That is a topic of its own, and I honestly, I couldn't begin to give you the uh, insights that, that you need to understand uh, the types of things the EPA regulates, what is a pesticide, and mm -hmm. the answer will surprise you, by the way. If yeah. you haven't done the, the Amazon pesticide training, that is as much of a, a recommendation I'm willing to give uh, on this podcast uh, go do the amazon pesticide training and you will know at that point how little you actually know yeah uh tim kramer says gasp i disagree beard oil very essential We're talking about beard oil not being essential goods then tim kramer comes back no joke we run out of mustache wax on amazon in europe side b says massive growth for us on amazon ebay shopify and all of our commerce wholesale customers better than q4 interesting nice. and it comes down to obviously the type of product you sell. Alan is surprised uh, with the review percentages. Uh, again, Alan, obviously part of the community. I know him quite well. We've spent time in Hong Kong, etc. But yeah, being on Amazon, it, we're very review sensitive either way, aren't we? About good reviews and negative reviews. I agree. And, and Joe says, so important to not run out of stock, which is obviously Boy, yeah, well said. very, very key in this uh, time. Um, okay, are you ready to wrap here? Is there anything you want to add before we go? No, I think, uh, you know, I, I would say as people consider this and, and look at these numbers, and again, you're welcome to go review them, uh, you know, play back this episode or go to osmers.com slash 192. You can see all those graphics. The, 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 a couple key takeaways. One, the future is bright for online. Mm -hmm. Some of the assumptions that we have made about online behavior shifting mm -hmm. are actually bearing out in people's, uh, own predictions about their own behavior. Hmm. All of that is very, very good for us. This reinforces that we are not too late. It's never too late. I, I can tell you 
many countless stories about how people have told me that the jig is up more than one time and we mm -hmm. have gone on to do uh, reasonable things. Let's say that. Yeah. So uh, I just want to reassure everybody, you know, stop thinking in terms of scarcity. Think in terms of abundance. You have nothing but upside in spite of this pandemic. And it pivot if you have to, but get with the game and uh, make something happen. Excellent. And you want to remind everyone the podcast number it will be appearing on? Yes. Episode number 192 of the awesomers.com. So awesomers.com slash 192. And we'll actually get the upload of the audio and video there as well. Excellent. Great. This will be out on Seller Sessions uh, tomorrow on the podcast, and I will also upload it to IGTV, and, of course, it will be on YouTube. Uh, if that's it, thank you, Steve, for today. I know you're super, super busy, so I'll let you go. We'll be back in the hot seat again next Thursday. Guys, I will be back on Sunday as a new times and dates, as I said before. I'm going to take off Friday and Saturdays now. So we're going to run Sunday until Thursday. So I bid you farewell. Stay home, stay safe, and I'll see you back here on Sunday for Mindset Sunday. Take care. Bye, everybody.